No, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. I got to get my notes out. I got, I got like three pages. Yeah. Thanks to my research guy. We've done a full investigative report. Trying to make for good stuff. <laughs> we have a lot of bad stuff. No, I'm just kidding. All right, let's roll through it. Um, this is a therapy session? Yeah. How are your feelings? <laughs> okay, there we go. How's it looking? We've never done this set, by the way. This like is it. it's a good set. He changes it every time. Yeah? Usually we do it out there. So, All right, pod, welcome back. We don't have a name. We never will. It's just the pod. We've got Anthony Surrendria. Dude, good. Yeah. Good. Surrendria. Anthony asked, I'm going to leave it. I'm going to leave it at that. Perfect. Welcome to the podcast, brother. Thanks, bro. Thanks for having me. I yeah. I, I, uh, so typically I go into these pods. He knows that. I just go. Yep. Today we've got, we've got some research. <laughs> go ahead. Your, through it. Your, uh, your history is phenomenal. Thank you. Um, and, and also just a journey in itself that I think is going to be fun to talk about. Thank you, brother. Um, before we get into the, the, obviously it's a business podcast. We'd just love to learn a little about you. Where'd you grow up? Where'd sure. you come from? And just pick me up to speed into high school. Let's say. It's perfect, dude. Yeah. Born in New York. Dad's a retired NYPD cop. Got hurt on the job. Mom worked in my elementary school. Had me, uh, you know, they were in, um, you know, we grew up in a pretty religious family that were, uh, in hindsight, I was blessed enough that they invested in private education, private school. So and my dad on a on a you know retired cop salary. My mom at elementary school put all four of us through a private Catholic school, which, as I look back, is just so beautiful. One for my own faith, but two, even just the the exposure and learning that I had throughout that. Those investments they made is really I owe uh, so much of my life, success, happiness to to you know what they did when I was a kid. So to be able to be in those those rooms, those environments, to learn at a higher level, to um, have the network of, you know, who ended up going to be mentors of mine, came out of some of these schools, things like that. So, yeah, dude, that's uh, – loved, uh, despite being five foot nine, my, my dream was always to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> you could be a good guard. <laughs> <laughs> I was all right at best. But, yeah, dude, that was – that you know, that was the dream. And uh, yeah, it take, takes us right up through high school. And, and man, I, the, I, you know, I know it's a business podcast, so I'll try and make it um, some, somewhat relevant. But um, – this idea of entrepreneurship wasn't even a even a thought. I didn't even know what the heck that was, and and uh, you know, again, went off to college at ASU, go Devils, to uh, to literally, uh, uh, you know, I was like, I'm only gonna be there one year. Then I'm gonna transfer to a small school, and try and play hoops at, and I just fell in love with it there. I love awesome. it. Awesome. So, oh, you said four. Are you youngest, oldest, middle? Oldest, oldest, oldest of four, of four. Yeah, and dude. your four is sisters, brothers, all boys, all boys. All boys. One, one short of the the starting five oh, of the hoops cool. team. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's awesome to start. I obviously didn't know where this would start. Um, yeah, same private Catholic high school. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where'd all the K through uh, K through twelve in Montana. Nice. Um, what was your graduating class? I'm just curious. 125 somewhere in there. 125, wow. 150. Yeah, so small. Yeah, ours yeah. was 30. Yeah, 30, so, oh. 120 yeah, was the whole high school. Okay, got it. Yeah, we, yeah, we were. 30, uh, 30 for us was our, our graduating class. Okay, wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah, yeah that is, but I, I would cool. agree. I think it, you know, is, you never know. I don't know if the education in itself right. was that much better. It was sure. just the attention and, and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the values. And, um, yeah, I, I attribute a lot of success to just that and staying connected in faith as a young person I think for is important. Sure. Well, the values, like you said, you know, whether it's an integrity or, or teamwork or handling adversity, a lot of things that get taught through faith, I think. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. So you went to ASU. Uh, what you, you got your degree? You yeah, finished? I got a degree. What did you get a degree in? Business management. Business management. Weirdly right, applicable. I, it was a random. Yeah. Just, I, I can curse on this podcast. I per, I you can do whatever you want. Cool. Like a random fucking, uh, you know, degree that I, because I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll just do the most generic thing I can do in, in business school and I'll figure it out from there and, uh. It's oddly applicable, actually. Yeah, which is funny. cool. Yeah, I, 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 uh, I'm a business major. Marketing was my yeah. side, but nice, s- dude. you know, yeah, s- yeah. same thing. Did you, do you feel college, the education standpoint, um, attributes anything to that's applicable to what you've done? Obviously, we have to get into everything you've done, but you know, or is it more of just the idea that you can follow through with something and, and finish it? It's so funny, dude. I get a lot of younger people asking me, should I go to college? Should they go to college or not? And I don't know the right answer. I know for me, college was insanely beneficial, but not necessarily for what I learned in the classroom. I think it was it was the network of people, the, the social life, being able to go live in the dorms to be off on your own and that, that growth that takes place during that time period. Um, some of the entrepreneurial clubs or marketing clubs uh, around that. Some of my friends today are still, you know, people I met back in college. Yeah. 
even down to hustling, like you were saying, you know, you're staying up till 5 a.m. cramming for a test the next day. Like th- those are all interesting, applicable learnings that, you know, you can move into business or you can move into hard work or life that, um, you know, isn't necessarily, you know, what's the difference of a, of a, a team and a group, you know, like, it, it, that yeah. you're, you know, the, the definitions in, in, in a class. But um, so I loved it for that reason. Um, but do I, do I think the actual education itself helped set me up? I wouldn't say so, but again, part of that's my own fault. I was, I was taking all online classes and I was working full time and I was just trying to, uh, you know, get a degree because they were told you're supposed to get a degree. Yeah. So what were you doing while you, when you were work like working full time, what were you doing? Oh dude, I was doing so many random jobs. I was, yeah. doing, I say full time. It wasn't like one full time job. I was at one point I was uh, getting up at 5am. I was a CrossFit personal trainer. So I'd wow. run a class at 530, 630. Then I'd go my dad and and uh, only the um, two younger brothers could drive at that time. So four of us shared a Toyota Camry. That car, I think, from like seven a.m. until seven p.m. never stopped moving around <laughs> around the valley. So he come. That's awesome. He'd leave. He'd wake up. He'd pick me up. I'd go drop him off at work. I'd go drive to North Scottsdale. I'm interning for free at a digital marketing agency. Then I get to my brother. He'd go to work. Da, da, da. He'd pick me up. So that that car <laughs> was in perfect transit. But dude, um, I was uh, valeting at night, personal training. I was a campus rep. I don't, I don't really even drink soda. I was a Coca Cola campus rep on campus, handing out co- Coca Cola cans. Like selling? Uh, or dude, is it just literally like you just, just like hand them out to to get people drinking them and then go dude, and buy more. It's such a such a waste of money for a company just handing out, you know, paying <laughs> paying you know marketing initiatives, which is just me just handing out yeah Coca Cola. Yeah. Um, uh, dude, just random stuff, just, just, okay. just odd jobs. But it, it started to form more and more. I'd say my junior and senior year towards digital marketing specific. Okay. Yeah. I, I feel like we're going to go down that route. Um, selfishly. Yeah. I need to go down that route Love it. for Let's a do lot it, of bro. solar reasons. Fun. Um, I was reading on your LinkedIn pocket for, or pocket your dollars yes, came sir. up and it also says it was acquired by media alpha. Yes. So obviously let's start there. That sounds cool. massive. Yeah. Thanks. Bro. What is pocket your dollars what do you like is it still alive what does it do yeah, yeah. what did it do just sure. walk us yeah, through yeah, yeah so uh it was a it was a business um that uh yeah recently exited april 1st and we this were this year uh, yeah this year wow yeah, 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 like congratulations six, six, six and some change months ago thank you very much um public company acquired us which is an interesting learnings through that too i can i can touch on but it was a lead generation business in the insurance and uh, financial services space so uh primarily towards time of acquisition we were doing I'm um, spending a few million bucks a month on paid social media channels for uh, Medicare insurance. So oh we, my would, gosh. we would ship a phone call off at our peak. I think we were doing like 13,000 inbound calls a day. Um, and we'd ship those off to United Healthcare, Humana, Aetna, and their, uh, their, or their, their sales floors below them. And they'd, they'd enroll the policy and they'd pay us every single enrollment they had. So we'd be enrolling hundreds of seniors a day into different oh my gosh. policies. And you sitting here on the pod started that. Uh, I, so I had a, a co-founder as well too. Yeah. Um, and a couple of my best friends um, wow. moved from my original business that I found was a traditional internet marketing agency. So we built that up to a decent size. It was a service industry. Got got a little uh, fed up with uh, you know clients calling call me on Saturday night at you know midnight, being like, "What the hell is going on with my my ads or anything like this?" So um, we were um, uh, mature enough to productize the service. So instead of saying, "Hey, five grand a month for Facebook ads," how about every time you actually you know, enroll a customer, you do an install of solar panels, as an example, you pay us at that point. So it became a really um, no brainer offer for that, for the um, actual brands themselves to be able to sign up because they only paid when they actually enrolled someone. <laughs> that's, that's funny. That's what we do with our lead providers right now. Oh, yeah, we, we, we've actually built our compensation plan, which I guess I'll ask you if yeah. that's, so we built our comp plan where we have a specific set amount of the commission stack, specifically 31% yeah. of it. Great. That goes to whoever provided the lead. That's great. Um, on average, it's a little over two thousand dollars in acquisition costs, yep. depending on lead provider. Fourteen hundred down to five hundred yeah, for sure. Um, so that I guess is very synergistic. Yeah. I love um, that. So so it gets acquired. What did you you What did you learn? I want to step back to how you yeah. started, but I want to get right to it. When did the top like When did the talk start? You're like, oh my gosh, we might. Like this might happen. Like, was that a goal of yours at the beginning? No, you know what? You know what's funny is um, I always thought it was a really great um, cash cow life cycle or um, geez, lifestyle business. Excuse me, and I, I loved it. I still, still, still love you know working in the business. Um, uh, I, I really do, and it really it started with you know we were doing a Tony Robbins event, and uh, he said you know uh, best lesson he was ever taught in life was to talk to investment bankers because they get access to. Uh, deal flow. They see what's going on in the market. 
and creating relationships with them is very important. And um, I literally took a note down for, I had no idea what an investment banker was or and anyone listening is basically a commission only salesman for businesses. They charge a percent of what the, whatever the business sales sells for. I had no idea that they also do other things, help take companies public or raise money, things like that. But um, I had no idea what it was other than Tony Robbins said to talk to him. So wrote the note down, reached out to a few friends that, that uh, then connected me to investment banks. And they started saying, Hey, you know, we actually have something here that can, that would get acquired or sell. And I'm like, okay, how much are these guys going to charge me to take me on a, a ride in a dance show here? And they're yeah. like, Oh, we, you know, we only charge a percentage of whatever the company's acquired for and you don't pay us anything before. I was like this, whole, that whole time up until the money was actually deposited in my account. Did I, think I was getting a free education. I said, this, this, there's no way this actually meaning sells. you didn't think it would happen. No, I didn't think it would happen. Yeah. No, no, no. I was like, this is, I'm getting a free education on, yeah. on this entire process. You know, everything we'd ever done has been bootstrapped, self-funded. So I would never raised money. I've never gone through a process like that before. So this whole world of VC, private equity, strategic acquirers, investment banks was all brand new to me. So again, I, li- I literally went out with the idea that, Hey, this is a really free education for me to go through this process, not thinking it would ever materialize into anything other than learnings that I can then apply back to my business to grow or into the future into what I do next or something like that. So wow. yeah, really, really. So to answer your question, no, it was not built to sell. I did not um, go hire an investment banker to, uh, you know, thinking that it would actually sell and was like ready to get the heck out of there. I was you really thought it was a lunch and some education. That's exactly right. Yeah. At what time, at what point did you start chatting with the investment banker? You said in April, was done, but like yeah. how long was that? About a year prior. So a year prior, a year. you send them all, you send all your information in, they take a look, they go, I think it's worth X, Y, Z. Then um, they say, here's the different companies we would pitch it to who have also sold co- or bought companies similar to yours. Here's some comps, just like real estate. Here's some market comps yeah. to you. And then you go you go through this, um, this process at first where I, I must have been on 100 different Zoom calls. And it was funny because it was like not COVID, but kind of COVID-y hangover where like people would... Uh, wouldn't be, fl- you know, flying out in person or meeting in person. So, like, the company that actually acquired us, I didn't even meet the CEO until, um, like, a month after we were already acquired. So, for that entire year process, like, we would all talk on Zoom calls and stuff like that. I never actually met, met him in person, which is so funny for me. I'm such a people person, want to go shake yeah. a hand and see, see someone in person. Wow. And, and and how old was the business when you got it acquired? Five years. So, you're only in it for five years. Five but years. you're you just said a minute ago in the business. So, you're still, they have you on doing something i presume 100 percent. yep so, yeah. so, so work, working like? with the business um making sure ships running well having a good good time you having access to you know it's a multi-billion dollar public company mm-hmm. seeing how they run some of the efficiencies and efficiencies in, in the business things that we did really well and i can see why it was a fit other things where it's like wow you know had i known this that would have been really good to apply into the business things like that so wow it's uh, a again learning lesson I, I i i like to think i've got a long horizon in life and in business and um, a few more cracks at it. So the more I'm, you know, I'm just trying to yeah. absorb as much as I can. Congratulations. Today. Thank you, man. I wow. appreciate it's it. It's rare. I just sit here and I blank questions because <laughs> I'm like, wow, that's a, how old are you? No, 31. 31 yes. by 31 already. And so you started this company when you're 26. Yes, sir. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And it um, also mentioned that you have, you were on Ellen. We were, we were on the Ellen DeGeneres show. Yes. She endorsed us, endorsed our brand. Yeah, that's right. And, and do you, did you have any, did you have any, um, part in that or like how did that come about yeah so it's uh it, it's so funny um this will be fun to share in the podcast um so <laughs> the, the internet world so much of of uh the world that you think is like uh maybe like organic is actually pay to play like so on so many different levels right which yeah totally like, oh makes sense right a lot of business people listen to your sales people like aha uh-huh. like we she takes first she wouldn't even take take us on the show she didn't like the category then she almost got canceled because she was you know yeah. being, being rude Remember. to her employees or whatever it was then she's like hey you want to come back i was like yeah we do now so i couldn't pay her enough to get on to the show then she said come back then we, then we paid her a few hundred thousand dollars to get on the show and um you know the the brain name exposure it's funny I, we do a ton in influencer marketing we have snoop dog floyd mayweather we have randy jackson from like i've probably worked with dozens of celebrities um, I've only met one of them, which was Chris Hansen from the catch a predator, which is funny. That's the only celebrity I've met paying, paying, you know, yeah. dozens and dozens of these, these, uh, these a, a lessers, which is always, always, cause people are always like, how's Snoop? I'm like, I have no idea. How, uh, never, never met him. <laughs> the check but, deposited. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Deposit, and, and I got that. <laughs> and and you back. got that back. But it's funny. Cause, um, you know, a lot of people think, okay, you go on the Ellen show and now all of a sudden you've got this huge brand, like the organic game in my opinion is, um, a lot harder to a quantify and track, but also, um, 
um, actually get the value you spent? Like, did I directly make that money back from being on your shirt? No, but did I land massive contracts, team members, things like that? Yes. So it was all the ancillary benefits that I knew going in would come out of it that would give us the credibility to work with certain vendors or softwares or cu- customers, things like that. It wasn't necessarily like, I'm going to go on, you know, we're going to go on our show and then we're going to get, you know, 50,000 calls coming in that are going to make me a half million and I only paid 400,000 for, you know, you know. It, yeah, it's so not a direct black and white like like regular lead gen would be. 100%, which is what I'm used to. So it was a very interesting, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, brain switch, if you will, focusing on branding versus lead gen. I'm so yeah. used to spend a dollar, make a dollar fifty. Cool you know, r- run that up all day long versus that I'm going to make a large couple hundred thousand dollar investment in order for branding. Yeah. My gosh, that's amazing. And, and, and in terms of lead gen, like when did that, was it in college? You said you were doing internships, like you started to learn how to do it. Um, you know, I, I started learning the internet, um, back in college. Yes. And a lot of it was Google AdWords at the time. And, uh, you know, it went from, you know, hustling around, like I said, whether it was going door to door selling solar hot water systems or personal training in the morning and all these things. Like I, I knew I wanted to influence people and be around people. And I, I always tell the story. I literally saw a guy shooting hoops on a Tuesday and I asked him mm-hmm. what he did. Um, and he said he worked on the internet and I, I talk fast. I move fast. Like the idea sitting in front of a computer for 10 hours a day, it sounded like absolute like torture for me. It sounded like worse than going to jail. Um, but I fell in love with this idea of having freedom of time, which now is, is funny because people work from home and it's not, it's not really like a, that new of a concept. But at the time it was like, you know, you were in an office nine to five. So the idea yep. of being able to go to the gym and shoot at 10 a.m. or something like that is actually what I fell in love with. It wasn't make money. It wasn't uh, be an entrepreneur, or drive a nice car. It was literally the, the idea of freedom of time to, to travel or do what I wanted on my own time or own basis. So, you know, at one point, like I would work to like, 4 a.m. start work at like 8 p.m. like because I, I could work at any time and get stuff done that's actually what I fell in love with which is actually an interesting lesson in itself when I think about it is um not focusing on the vehicle getting you somewhere but focusing on the the, the destination so the vehicle of sitting in front of a computer and for multiple hours a day again horrible vehicle to get me to my end destination which was freedom of time um, which is what I yeah. actually wanted yeah that's uh, wow that was deep actually so your your end goal has always been it's not a monetary uh, number. Sure, yeah, it's freedom. You know, and, and it uh, I think it evolves. Um, and, and again, I, I want to say also too that that's been my focus, just because I feel like that's more. So I, I remember buying a really nice pair of shoes, and then a couple of weeks later, I thought they were okay, and then I got another nice pair of shoes, and I felt good, and then they, it was this idea of relativity. Things became yes. relative, and. At first, it was like, this is kind of depressing, but then it was like, oh, wait, this is the wrong focus. So there's nothing wrong, and I think maybe people have to learn that lesson on their own, but there's nothing wrong with saying, I want a Lamborghini. I'll just tell you, when you get that, it's not the, f- it's not the long-term sustainable feeling you want. No, There's a much deeper want, in my opinion, or at least I've found for myself, I'll always speak from experience, that is premium fuel, if we're going to use a, a car analogy, not unleaded. The premium fuel for me at first was freedom of time, then I had it. Then it was, I wanted to, I said, oh shit, my brother doesn't have this freedom of time or happiness in life. He's probably going to have a boss that's an a-hole. So then my fuel was, I want to hire my brother so that he can actually have freedom of his day and enjoy life and be able to enjoy you know, every hour he's up, not just the hours he's not at his nine to five, after work or before yep. work. So that became my premium fuel. Then it was my friends and then it was my customer. I fell in love with my customer, saving them money. And saying, I want to help a million customers a year save money on their finances through insurance. So making sure you got the right insurance, saving your prescription pills, things like that, or other financial products we were pushing. So that ever evolving, you know, now my, my, my goal is I'm going to, I'm going to build a billion dollar valuation company in the mental health or the financial illiteracy space or financial literacy space, helping people manage their, those two tie very closely together. Someone who's, you know, I think like 70% of all stress or some stat and who knows where these fucking stats come from, come from financial hardships. Right. But um, these are two things I'm very passionate about that I'm very energized with. And I think, I think, you know, it's, it's funny cause I, I look at myself and I'm like, you know, a lot of people are like, how's retirement life? And I'm like, I think I'm working more hours now when I don't have to work, um, oh. on what I'm going to do next and figuring that out and being in the, the mind space or talking to the right people or educating myself with experts in those two spaces. Um, because that goal of what I want is so strong, it pulls me so hard all day long. And if I wanted a plane or a yacht or another car or a bigger house i don't think these things would even come within the same universe as excitement for me and again that's no judgment if that excites someone today i think that's fucking awesome i just 
I, I don't think it's the it's the best fuel you're putting in your your car, if you will, from a motivational yeah. standpoint. Yeah, I think you have to fall in love with the just progression and progress in your business yeah. and seeing it grow. And there's this quote going back. You, you mentioned the Lamborghini, and it's relative. You're right. Uh, I remember on a vision board, uh, I had two major things on my vision board. Yeah. It was I always wanted an all black Range Rover, Great. and I always wanted a red faced Rolex. Yeah. Well, when I Literally, when I got, I call it the 48-hour rule. Mm -hmm. When you buy that new car, so I get the Rover. Yep. Nice. Within 48 hours, like, the initial, high what is it, off. like, the yeah. high is gone. It's just yeah. another car. Yep. Um, same with the watch. And now I don't even remember the last yes. time I, frankly, even, I still, I'll always have that to the day I yeah. die because it's that piece. Yeah. Um, but I say that because I believe it doesn't fulfill you. Yeah, for sure. But the quote that I see online a lot of times says something along the lines of, I'd rather be crying in a Lamborghini than a Toyota. Sure. I disagree. Sure. Yeah. Because nice. if you're crying in a Lamborghini, you're admitting to yourself that there's nothing that can truly fulfill you. Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, major failures make you cry in a Lamborghini. But yeah. that it, it, it's a progress, I guess. Um, so, so I want to dig into that because it sounds like your passion is the time freedom component. Sure. Which... Um, you, obviously, you don't know anything about Soulfinity, but we have something called Financial Fridays. It's an right. internal progress or um, podcast, which this will more than likely also service on Financial Fridays. Right. And its entire goal is financial literacy. Oh, amazing, man. Because our reps, like these guys are making four, five, six grand a deal. Sure. Some of them are making, you know, quarter million, some of them a half million mm -hmm. dollars a year. That's great. And in every other sales company, we found that they're teaching them how to be an idiot with their money, yeah. how to spend, 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 spend to keep them working. Yep. We're like, man, if we can give them so much knowledge, almost like a course, they're going to be wanting to stay even longer, even if they're like almost in kind of like retirement mode. That's great. Um, so I, I want to start there with like, l l let's actually go forward, then we'll come back. Now that you've made some money, which we, okay. you know, I, you can share as much as you're, or a little sure. as you're comfortable with. What are you doing yep. just tactically, financially to park sure. money in different spots so you yeah. get residual income, I imagine, different things? Absolutely. Yeah, right now, tactically speaking, um, my money in quote-unquote cash is in T-bills, so treasury bonds, um, yeah. earning a decent yield percentage. I can borrow against those. Again, I'm not trying to get too far out there with, with what I'm um, – uh, uh, two in the weeds if, it, if it's uh, no 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 we, we talk about but bonds on our podcast okay yeah. great yeah um so a lot of my cash is there i also believe um you know um the it's not about timing the market it's time in the market amen uh, um so Tony Robbins. yeah there you go again so yeah un unshakable well done yes um yep. so i follow his principles very closely as far as uh point being is 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 being in the market so i, I do have money in the market no matter how far down it goes it, it, for me it's i'm buying something on sale it's the, such a funny psychology for most people when the market's going down you go shit i gotta get out right now and then when it's going up you go i gotta buy it's more funny. right now right and so it's um i think it's a buffet be greedy when others are feel fearful and fearful when others are greedy mm -hmm. and i think that that's interesting because if we look back even six seven eight months ago a lot of greed NFTs, crypto, day trading on Robinhood, all these, a lot of great, I'm going to buy on margin, all these things. And, you know, I kept hearing like, oh, so-and-so is making a million bucks. They're making, the, they are today until that same psychology gets them in the hole. And now you're seeing, uh, it's very unfortunate. This it's is quiet like, now, isn't it? Yeah, but, it, <laughs> and, and, and unfortunately that quiet's going to turn to a lot of pain. And I, and, and I'm not excited about that or proud about that or being like, ha ha, that happened to you. I'm saying that those same principles that were making you so much money are the same ones that are going to drive you so far down. In, 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 in a hole in the, in the wrong direction and it, whether it's getting cold on margin loans or or again not 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 focusing on working hard bettering yourself finding actually a, a sustainable income versus I'm, I'm a day trader and I'm making a ton of money so these um, th th these principles are very important to me get, uh, um, getting time in the market like we said and uh, getting back on track excuse me um, Ray Dalio having a actual um, you know, uncorrelated assets. So I've got money in real estate. I do still have some money in cryptocurrency, but it's a, it's, you know, I would say 5% of my net worth. And uh, I think that's even potentially aggressive. Um, and I'm okay with a long horizon. I'm okay with that being there for 20 years. I'm also, I look at it as, um, um, t uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Tail risk where that thing, I think could 20 X, 30 X, or it can go to zero. And I'm okay with that. Um, I probably have 40% of my money in equities. Um, let me see. I have uh, life settlement, which is an interesting non-correlated asset, probably two, 3% of that. I can touch on that if anyone's interested. Probably got another, 
Uh, I'm going to use round numbers now. 10% in private equity. So it's not public markets, but it's it's private equity funds, not not uh, individual companies. Um, focus very heavily on low fees, so fidu- true fiduciaries. Um, a lot of times if you're with a you know, a Morgan Stanley or you're with, with some of these companies, they're, you're in high expense ratios. Um, yep. you're, you're being charged fees on the back end you're not even aware of by your financial advisor that's looking out for you. Um, and they're not. Again, back to Tony Robbins' book, Unshakable, I would highly recommend anyone starting off. Amazing book, actually. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. So uh, keeping uh, low fees, being time in the market is very important. And then right now, just uh, you know, um, mentioned a little bit of real estate, and I'm going all over the place now, hard money lending a little bit too. Uh, round, rounding out um, the where I th- where my money is primarily, but right now the majority of the cash from my sale is actually in treasury bonds and, and T bills. Yeah, so I, I want to get more advanced for my own. Sure. Per- so the the meetings I've been having lately have been a lot more real estate, yep. um, and and obviously there's maybe some plays coming in the next sure. sixteen months. Um, what I've been finding in the circles that I've been surrounding myself, and I'm trying my hardest to be the worst in every circle yeah, I'm that's in. Great. Likewise. A lot of them are, you know, I've always, so I'm, I'm like a, uh, a Dave Ramsey. Nice. Um, I don't like debt. I, if I yeah. buy a car, I want to buy it cash. If I buy a house, I'd prefer to buy it cash, you sure. know, everything. Um, but a lot of them, they'll have the cash, mm-hmm. but they'll borrow against an asset, even though they have the cash. Sure. Um, does any part of that connect with you? And if yeah. so, why would you prefer to do that? I mean, I know why now sure. I would, but. Do you do that at all? Um, not, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely, I would say I'm probably maybe one or two notches away from you or Dave Ramsey. I, I, I believe uh, that rule probably definitely applies for 95% of people, which is the psychology of taking out too much debt and leverage and problems. Right. Um, I've always borrowed a very, at a low rate, low percentage of my overall portfolio against, we'll call it stocks or treasury bonds to be able to arbitrage the interest rate. So if it t- costs me, three or 4% to go take out a margin loan today against my treasury bonds. And by the way, I, I, I hate that we're even talking about this because I hope 99% of the people listening never do this at all. And I It's a very dangerous game. It's extreme. I really yeah. hope it doesn't happen at all. Um, I kind of wish I didn't even go down this rabbit hole, but all good. Um, <laughs> and maybe like uh, I won't get a margin call until I'm at, like if it's treasury bonds, maybe like 80% even sometimes so they'll end up to me. I might take out 20% of that and just right. arbitrage it with like, a hard money deal that's maybe like v- very collateralized against an asset that's loaned at a very low LTV um, that, you know, is going to pay me at this point, maybe like a 10 or 11, 11 point percent. So I'm arbitraging essentially. It cost me four to borrow, 11 to yield. Um, and again, to, to your point, why aren't you just doing that with cash? You're, you're, you're absolutely right. I would say for myself, I am in the liquidity is uh, important to me at this point, which I guess you could argue is, is, um, you know, I could get from the uh, lending and then using it for uh, to buy a business or actually buy a business coming in. So for me, I've got my, my plan with having it uh, liquid at this point is is to, uh, or semi-liquid with the treasury bonds, is to um, be able to buy a business that's shown some product market fit that maybe is doing, um, you know, a million bucks EBITDA or something like that at this point that the founders or engineers very, very um, tech focused that don't know how to take their, their product or service that's just so darn good um, and helps yep. so many people, but they don't know how to take it to market. So that's my broader plan. But 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 to your point, you're ab- you're absolutely right. Ninety nine percent of people, and even now that I'm talking to you, I, you know, I'm looking back. I, I actually don't think I have any outstanding debt at this point, as far as um, um, no, I don't actually have any else. I have a little bit on a car. I like maybe like a hundred thousand dollars on a car. But that's it. That's yeah. The- well, I bring it up because uh, he's been he's met some of them, and and some of my other partners have been yeah. on my podcast. Um, we had a. Um, a flip. We bought it in 2020 in, in June in Paradise Valley. Yep. We bought a 3,000 square foot house um, for like a million and a half. Nice. Put like four into it. And we just got it under contract for 15. That's great. And there's eight of us in on it. And we were BSing at lunch last week. Yep. And I was like, yeah, part of me in that deal looking back as a return, I'd, I'm probably not, I'm not, I don't want to share the return on camera, sure. maybe off camera, you can chat. But sure. um, I was chatting with them and I was like, part of me wished I just took out a loan. Sure. of some sort, whether depending on how I did it, whatever, doesn't matter, arbitrage. Yep. But I just did cash. Yeah. And, um, and and come to find out, here I am, we're almost two years down the project later, it's almost done. I found out that um, a few of those investors had done that. Sure. And um, that that whole world is just, I'm 26, so I'm, yeah. I'm younger than you, I don't have as nice. much experience, that whole world starting to evolve sure. to me, and I'm yeah. trying to figure out who does it, who doesn't, why do they do yeah. it, why don't they? 
Yeah, I think it's just uh, I think people that do it specifically in real estate. It's it's again, you know, it's being able to. If you got a million bucks, you know, you can essentially put we'll call it a million five to work, if you will, if you're borrowing right. you know, against your portfolio, and you're able to borrow half half of that or something like that. So allows you to to you know build faster, which also you know that comes with risk. There's no you know the term there's no free lunch. Like there's the risk is that you could lose faster if you're building faster, you could lose faster. So I'm in the same boat as you. I've I've very rarely taken out debt and if it has it's been really as a learning experience to be able to arbitrage the interest rate like i mentioned yeah. with some really secure collateralized assets it's not to double down on a on a stock pick you know or something yeah, like that totally so, that's what i'm trying to yeah. not get them to think yeah. it's also important to use debt in certain scenarios so you sure. actually have some credit yeah. uh, obviously so that's why you know you do it in certain times um but i again i don't want to go too far sure. down that because yeah. obviously you're the lead gen guy sure um, you've done that, been there. So talk to me about lead gen, um, in 2022 going yep. into 2023. Yep. What do you see working right now more than ever? Do you see the TikToks and the reels sure. or is it something different? Yeah. It's, and, uh, I'm, I'm admittedly probably not the right guy to ask for the, the, um, X's and O's, but I can definitely speak from a strategic perspective. So I haven't launched an ad myself for maybe four or five years. I have a whole team underneath yeah. me that, that does that, but, uh, I'm still heavily involved in the strategy. Um, not, not necessarily, you know, this bidding strategy versus this one, but overall, how do you, uh, attract consumer to take action? And I believe, um, there's a few components in today's day and age. I'm competing for, um, your attention. I'm competing with your, your brother, your sister, your mother, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your best friend to be able to stop the scroll. If we're talking about social media, um, and I need to do that in a few different ways. So we use celebrities again to build credibility, not to actually sell. So some of our worst ads would be just Ellen herself talking about our product or services like uh, medicare as an example you get people calling and be like hey can i talk to ellen or hey what was that again does she really? give away money what people. is she doing yeah <laughs> with, with all celebrities right so yeah um that might be like a good attention um grabber but for us uh it's called ugc user generated content but what we have is we have a real live testimonial from a past client so i have a full-time individual that's calling back on you know, they're not really my customers. They're United Healthcare's, but they are my customer. I drove them. So calling back these leads and these calls and asking if they enrolled, if they did, would you be willing to share a uh, quick video on your cell phone? And it's just a selfie video and we don't really give much direction at all. I just, we just want to hear before you called where life was financially, all the things that it helped you with. What were you scared of before the call? What, what made you kind of slow down? So it's very real life, and we're, we're seeing that perform, and you're even starting to see it on TV if you look at some of these, like, SoFi or some of these other companies where yeah, they I've actually are, like, selfie styles. And we've been doing that for, like, four years plus at this point. I'm not saying, like, oh, we, we, we you know, uh, pioneered Invented this. Invented it, yeah. I'm not saying that by any means, but w it's worked for us for so long, and it's very interesting to see that move on Extremely. to TV and other places. But it's that human connection of someone saying, hey, when I was in your shoes, this is how I was feeling. This is what I was scared of. This is what happened when I got over those fears and scares, um, and here's the benefit I got. And oh, hi, I'm a live, I'm a live person. I'm stuttering when I'm talking. The camera's shaking a little bit. It's a little dark. You yeah. can't hear perfectly. Like, those are the things I'm seeing work uh, better than ever today on social media. Is that that as close to a real interaction as possible? Not even. And, and this is a generic statement, by the way. That doesn't mean it's always true, but not as much, um, you know, high production value. If someone thinks they got to go spend fifty grand on an advertisement or. Uh, getting, getting sometimes actually cheaper the sure. better um yes. no, how do you incent yeah. when you're calling them yeah how do you like what's the incentive for them to do that yeah it, uh, the best incentive is if it's someone we actually really help save a lot of money so the Got incentive it. is they want to pay they're it just forward. like man we're thank you so they much had for the such help. a good experience they want to pay it forward right and that is that's who we're targeting right so your hand kind of cherry picking you know we, we might make you know 200 contacts a day or something like that. And we might only get one video every other day, but the video is fucking awesome because yeah. it's someone who actually got so much help and they want to pay it forward and share it. Great. Now there is opportunity for the individual to give up to a hundred dollar Amazon gift card to someone, but that, that starts to dilute. I would say the, how genuine it is coming out. So for us, even like getting back to the celebrity piece influ influencers, like Floyd Mayweather is not a great influencer for us because he's very, doesn't speak very well. He can't read that well. He kind of might talk a little slow, and it's very ingenuine. You can kind of tell he's reading. Our best, our best celebrities were always comedians because they'd get on there and be like, "Hey, man, what the heck are you doing out here? Looking at me? Are you listening? Are you listening? You know?" And you're, <laughs> boom, that converts, and it's someone that no one even knows. Like I might not even know who it is, but the person's so charismatic versus like a big face or name that's like. And yeah. then I think you should call today. You know, 
what was the brand called again? Yeah, hundred <laughs> percent. So that that genuinity is very important. But to answer your answer your question, it's ideally someone who got such a good customer customer experience that they're willing to pay it forward and spend a couple minutes on the phone. And you know, we make the pitch. Then we say, hey, we we, we want to be able to help other people just like you that were in a lower financial position or you were in a uh, a product that wasn't saving you the right money because maybe you're you're. Uh, insurance agents jammed you into something that they had high fees versus something else, you know yeah. something that was actually best. You're for like, them. man, we really helped you, and they're just stoked to help. That, that's the, the that's the best person by far, and okay. I and by far that's yep. that's if if I could only target those people, I would. Um, and, and we try to, and then but once in a while we, we might give away like an Amazon gift card or something to them for taking the time or going through the energy. Yeah, yeah, because our strategy obviously we're nine months old, so sure. we have a long way to go. But our strategy has been. Um, Google, rev- like to start, it's just been Google yep. reviews. Yep. We just want them to Google Sulfinity Power and not yep. feel scared of what they see. Great. And so every install we've been sending um, a branded, it's actually over there, and the, it's a yeah. branded card. I'll have them grab it. And um, it's, you know those robots that write the notes? Sure. Yes. So yeah, Excel doc, I just yep. sent 27 out today. It looks like a handwritten note. Yeah, and it's thanking them. From the rep, though, because we use the rep's name, yeah. and then we give them a $25 gift card and say, hey, by, by the way, my manager's really love it when you leave positive yeah, reviews. Yeah, so great. Um, so we've started there. Is there the the note in there? Oh, perfect. Yeah, so it's, yeah. It, it, it looks like that. Um, Let's take a peek. And again, the, the goal is, yep. you know, that's what it looks like when it shows up in the mail. And the goal, hey, token appreciation. It's trying to be personalized, per se. Yeah. Um, this is great. How badass is it? This looks so real. Yeah, it's Isn't crazy. It I mean, it's, it's awesome. a real pen. Yes. It's awesome. uh, and they can handle 2000 a day from yeah. what they've told me. Yeah, it's uh, so badass. Yeah. So, I love it. So, so you guys use a lot of funnels, I'd imagine? You know, we our funnel isn't even, like, insanely crazy. It goes from, I'll call it, like, video ad to our own and operated websites. And it might even be, like, a one-page advertorial or something. Yeah. With the only call to action that actually makes make an inbound call. person doesn't call. They get into a retargeting So super list. simple. Super simple, dude. It really wow. is. Yeah. Yeah. And we spend a lot of time training the algorithm on the perfect customer for us. So for us, we'll push back like a 45 minute call or something. So the algorithm gets more mature. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going pr- you know, no, to, you know, back back up. When you say push back a 45 minute sure. call, what do you mean? Um, so essentially fire a conversion pixel on, in the platforms when as far down the funnel as possible is, Got it. is what you're aiming for. So back in the day I was, you know, we were one of the first advertisers on Facebook, not in this business when I was interning. And you would search, like, what pages to target. So you'd be like, likers of Oprah, likers of Weight Watchers. And, like, that's who you would target today. Like, in my opinion, again, I'm not not the X's and O's guy at this point, but the further down the funnel, we can fire a conversion pixel to basically tell, we use Facebook as an example. Facebook, this is the perfect customer for us. So for us, someone who spoke on the phone for 45 minutes on an inbound sales, sales call, someone who probably enrolled in an insurance policy, go find me more of these people. And then we create lookalike audiences based off of that. So most people right now are maybe doing lookalikes to someone who watched a video for three seconds or someone who came to my webpage or maybe someone who clicked the phone number button or filled out a form or something. Like, And these are great, but think about me teaching Facebook, someone who spoke on the phone for 45 minutes. They're able to get so laser focused on who to serve that ad to. Um, I got you. That it's, it's much harder for someone to compete who is teaching Facebook to go find me people that'll watch my video for three seconds. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's like a crash course right there. <laughs> um, at your peak, or maybe that's right now, how much was the spend per month? Per month, or dude. Like, maybe uh, give me a record. Yeah, our, our record day, I think we've spent 300 or $350,000 in a day. Wow. Um, on... Um, Facebook alone. And was there a reason why that day you decided to spend that much? Was yeah, it like it was, a, uh, it was like think of like it's op- called open enrollment. It was like basically like a call like a Black Friday for like an e-commerce brand or something like that. Oh, gotcha. So we get we get like a five week window where people can uh, anyone can switch their policy and it's and it's, and you go 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 and you go real hard and it actually starts in uh, this Saturday, so October fifteenth. We got another go 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 for yeah yeah for till December seventh. So we, we got, a, got a nice run. So it was during that period. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, the the ad side is very interesting. Selfishly, I kind of want to sure. ask about what would you do if you're in solar? Yeah. How, how would that look? Or, you know, the industry is just popping. And uh, fortunately, sure. there's nobody really good at doing ads That's yet. Great. Um, so we're, we're, we have probably five or six that we're starting to just, we're just finding guys and seeing yeah. who's going to stick. It's great. Um, like, how would you angle that if you're in my shoes? Yeah, I would. Um, 
just like any product that's, uh, I think, potentially a little more complicated to understand, mm-hmm. I would have a uh, lead with, and this, 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 sound, this is going to sound simple, but I think some of the best advice is like simple advice. It's not like, oh, shit, that's a lot of work, you know, or something like that. It's like, oh, we can carry that out. And I, I always thought the, the best mentors I ever got or advice were people that made it very, I was like, oh, I can do that. That's not a big deal. I would, I would first, um, uh, I guess tactically a few things. I would upload your current customer data, people that actually, uh, you know, actually installed a, uh, a solar project. And I would um, upload that to all these platforms and basically as a customer list and then say, hey, uh, let's, r- let's get some lookalike audiences to these customers. So let's target people that are similar in demographic, on online behavior, psychographics as these people that have already bought from me. So that, that, that would be my first audience set to start from. The ads that I would be running would be a real homeowner, ideally, or an actor that looks like one, but ideally it's a real homeowner that is leads with the benefit right away. So if I lead with cash in your face, I might stop the scroll right away versus like so many companies go, hi, right, we're so finity. Dude, no one cares. They're gone. Yeah. Or, so leading very quickly, like I saved $47 a month on my utility bills through um, this company or something like that. So right in your face, stops the scroll, got it. Hey, if you're a homeowner in certain zip codes, there's new um, government programs. And I'm making some of this shit up because I, I I'm not up to date with it. But <laughs> it's funny because it sounds just like all these ads the, you see. Yeah, yeah, yeah there's, there's new government programs yeah. that allow you to save up to whatever. Like I'm, I'm a big fan. We always talk about it always comes back to money. Even a Medicare policy comes back to money for the savings for the individual. We've talked so much about saving seniors money. Meanwhile, you're like, dude, you're, it's an insurance health insurance policy. What are you talking about? So um, th- that's ho- how much our marketing is, is centered around that. So similar here to, you know, I was able to save $653 a year on my utility bills through these new programs based on my zip code, um, you know, before. So I get into the benefit, the qualifications. If you're a homeowner, if you make over blank or you have a credit score over blank or whatever it is, you could qualify for those benefits we just talked about. Now let's talk about the before. Before I was, and this is where all the reservations come out. I thought solar was really expensive. I thought it was even a scam, some of these companies out there, um, which really scared me, so I never even really paid attention to any of them. Um, uh, and all the reservation points is basically I'd hit on right there. I was paying $225 a month on my utility bills, and it yeah. became really expensive to the point where like me and my husband would fight because um, I couldn't turn down the air conditioning. Um, and that, that was, uh, that was just like, you know, it actually ended up, be, we ended up going to counseling for that. Like, I mean, I, I mean, uh, you know, I'm being really, really crazy on purpose, but you yeah. get the point, like really step into their shoes. And I, I always joke in some, some podcasts, like I used to be like, consider myself a method actor. Whereas like when we were helping people get out of debt, I, I actually defaulted on medical bills. So I could feel like it, what it would feel like to get collection calls and letters in the mail because I could, I didn't know what it was like to be in debt. I didn't know I was, it, you'd be, you'd literally at one point I put my phone out in the living room because I was getting debt collection calls all the time on it. And I was like, holy shit, this is what people feel like. So imagine me as a marketer talking about. So you put, you actually did that? I got like myself in debt. Yeah, 100%. You put yourself. I did. Yes. To go, to, to, to go through wow. the process. Yes. To, to feel it, to feel to what it felt like. To see exactly what they're going through. So I knew exactly what someone felt like. I know exactly what they felt like. And I could talk much differently than get a few interest rates off your credit card. I was like, are you tired of being afraid that someone's going to show up at your house and serve you? on something or are you scared or looking at your phone yeah are you scared to check the mail have you had to change your phone number a few times and that's so much more powerful when you're able to talk from that emotional standpoint so similarly here too i would really you you probably do but spend some time deeply intimately understanding your customers challenges and uh pain points that keep them up at night and i know that's just like a generic marketing term but like really really like you hear it and people are like okay yeah i'll find the pain points no like really what the fuck is keeping someone up at night that doesn't have solar installed on their home that they're missing out on and what scares them about solar? And I hit that dead on every time. And then the, the, the last portion of, the, of this video ad, if you will, is how great life is now. Now that I got it, yep. I got that. I was actually able to take my daughter. Here she is. Bring her on camera in the kitchen. Go get new school supplies for this upcoming. Or, you know, we're going to be able to get more, more Christmas presents this year. Wh- whatever it is, right? Like I'm being super funny and aggressive, but, y- but y- I think you're understanding where I'm, where I'm going with it, hopefully. But w- how great life is today. And then the call to action. People love and need to be told what to do. Call them right now. Don't waste another minute. You need to call. Call right now. Click that button. It's actually right below here to the right. You'll see it. Go do it. And it's not even like a high production, like, dink, like you see on, like, you know, you see some ads, that, like, gener- genuinely, like, hey, if this didn't speak to you, or if this spoke to you, why are you still listening to me? Click click the button. You know, like, very much 
tell someone where to go, what to do, what's going to happen. When you get there, you're going to fill out, uh, you know, a quick questionnaire. It's going to take you maybe two minutes. They're going to tell you how much you qualify to save. I highly recommend you doing it. You know, do it, do it right now. Please. Wow. <laughs> She just made a, uh, there's a course. What, what do you charge for that course? <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. That's awesome. um, yeah, the, the, um, the, uh, the concepts actually, first of all, it's funny. The first thing you said was get list of uh, who we installed with, yep. which is one of the first questions yep. Brandon actually grabbed from me nice. to make something. I don't know. Love it. I, don't, yeah, yeah. I don't do any of that. Sure. I just try to find people that know how to do all Love that. It. So, so I'm asking. Um, I, I know that time's valuable, so I want to keep it moving. And, sure. and, and I want to know your kind of like day to day now. Yeah. And then I want to end with obviously DJing, sure. which I want to hear about, oh, but I want to awesome. know what your, you know, call it weekdays look like right now, sure. especially you just exited a company. Yeah. Uh, what's that look um, like? Admittedly, I haven't been in the um, day to day, the business meaning like the tech, like I said, like moving the ads or anything like that. So I would still work full time on the business, but it wasn't um, like if I just, dis- if I disappeared, the business would still, um, would still survive and it would grow actually at a point. I remember that was one wow. interesting, one interesting thing just to I, and I, uh, go back a little bit. <clears throat> I remember when I was so in the day to day weeds of the business, I booked myself a trip to Thailand. It was, I think it was like four or five months out and it was on purpose and it was because it was an opposite time zone. And I knew I needed to teach my team, teach my customers, more importantly myself that I um, am not going to be on call to be able to help at any time. So I had, I think it was like four or five months to essentially engineer my business to where I was not, needed. I'm not saying I didn't help it grow, <clears throat> but if I wasn't there, the business didn't falter or die or didn't fall that badly. And, and I, I realized it was mostly training myself more than anything that relinquishment of control. And that was, that was probably the single best thing I've ever done in business was that was forcing my hand to go to an opposite time zone where it was daytime here. I was sleeping there and vice versa. So I either wasn't going to freaking sleep when I went to Thailand or I was going to learn how to, how to, um, build out an actual team around me to be able to, to run the business without me and empower my team to be able to do that. And it's a, this is a very um, aggressive uh, story I told in a, a mentorship session the other day, but uh, we just got a, my girlfriend and I just got a, a little baby puppy, little dog. And oh, wow, uh, I just got one too. Oh yeah. Two months What'd you get? A uh, mini Australian mountain <laughs> doodle. That's awesome. Yeah. We got a uh, very similar, get? it's a toy poodle. So there you go. Five pounds. Zeus, big almighty Zeus. Zeus. Oh, well, yeah. Five pounds. <laughs> but um, he's shitting everywhere in the house and I would shove his face in it. And cause I thought that's what you're supposed to do. And he started getting scared to shit to the point where he oh. would, he would literally hide under the, like if he was going to the bathroom and I stood up to go get dr- a drink of water, he would hide and run. He thought I was in trouble. So I taught him wrong, and I think this is a very aggressive analogy for what we do with our teams. I'm certainly not con- considering my my contractors or employees as dogs, but that training of when there's a problem, call Anthony or come back to me or CC me on every email. I've trained you to be afraid to make mistakes. I've trained you to not uh, embrace autonomy, um, and that's a problem that I had to untrain, just like my dog now. Now when he shits, I pick him up, put him on his pad, and I'm all excited and give him a treat. <laughs> so he, he's learning more and more to, to get because I'm being better at, at teaching him the environment that's okay for him to act and interact. And so yeah. we do this very often with our team. So unwinding that, the good news is just like my dog's very smart and starting to learn where to go to the bathroom. Our team, and again, this is a terrible analogy when you look at it at face value as far as like, am I, am I talking about employees being dogs? But the... Overall, though, when you're, when you're looking at it, like I, I did a very poor job of creating a culture and environment with my team that allowed them to be autonomous and have actual ability to think and grow on their own and be okay to fall on their face and make mistakes. So I had um, uh, two more things and I'll get back to the question, but I had someone on my team uh, f- about a year, year and a half after that misspend like, I think it was like $30,000 in a weekend, like a pretty decent considerable amount of money, especially at that, at that time. And um it spent it on air We no one, it was an accident. He accidentally clicked on a campaign that, that shouldn't have. And I remember I had a choice at that time. Do I reprimand him, get mad at him or, um, do I embrace it? And I said, and he told, he, I knew he'd done it. I knew we were meeting and I said, dude, I'm so happy you did that. And he literally was like, I've never seen someone more shocked. He's like, dude, I literally was throwing up last night cause I was so scared this morning. I'm like, no dude, you failed being aggressive. That's fucking awesome. Cause I realized there's such a hidden opportunity cost if I had reprimanded him that he would be scared to scale and spend at high levels and quick and fast if I had slapped his wrist. And I knew that was much more costly than $30,000 training him to be scared to be able to make mistakes. Yep. And 
you know, flash forward a few years later, this guy manages millions and millions of dollars, and sometimes at a month for me, and very profitably. And and I, and I think that was a very pivotal pivotal moment, excuse me, in me becoming a better manager and a better leader to to look at wow. that from 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 that standpoint. And then um, la- last last case is uh, I disappeared like maybe like a, two years ago at this point. I went to a meditation retreat in Sedona. I had no technology, no anything for a week, and it was tough for me to be away from technology for that long. Uh, really good growth opportunity, but. I came back and the business had grown. We had our, re- our record day. We had the best day we ever had while I was gone. And I, I knew at that moment that I had built a culture and a team that was autonomous without me. So to, to, to wrap that all, all back in, um, hopefully that earlier story is applicable to where, you know, that, that ending story is that it I is. talked about for two, two, two years ago. But uh, yeah, my day to day. So I, 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 I spent some time uh, making sure, you know, the, the company that acquired us, I'm doing right there. And um, I don't necessarily have a obligation to do that, other than for myself. I think I, I'm, I know I've, I've. You get one brand, one personal brand, and one reputation, and um, it's very important to me that um, when I go to raise money, when I go to take a company public, when I go to sell another company, I know the company that bought me should be one of the first calls that next that next person or or institution calls and says, "How was it when you paid Anthony a bunch of money for his company?" It's very important to me that that call says it was the best decision we ever made. That's very important. So I'm yep. spending a lot of time making sure that that comes to fruition. Again, not because I'm economically incentivized to do that, because I I, I, I think long term it's the right move um, for where I want to go in life and what I want to do and what I want to build. So I'm spending time there, spending a, a, a decent percentage of my time um, getting more and more uh, educated on investments. So a group called Tiger 21 um, – it's like a, if you've heard of EO or YPO, um, any of these groups are like biz- peer-to-peer business groups. This is specifically for investment. Um, I think there's a minimum a, a, um, net worth amount to be in there, but there's there's you know two individuals in the room that are billionaires. So imagine getting to speak to a billionaire and ask him what right. is he what is he doing with his portfolio or investment portfolio and things like that. And there's many versions of that too that I think are really important. So just like you said, um, getting advice from someone who actually has been there, done that, is practicing what they're preaching. So if I came here and I was like, yeah, you know, it's all in crypto. The next question should be, well, what percentage of, uh, you know, you should put all your money in cryptocurrency. What percentage of your net worth in cryptocurrency? That's the right question to ask, right? And and, and it's not even necessarily a dollar amount because for, for, you know, someone they might say 100 bucks, but they only have $1,000 in their bank account. That's a high percentage where if I say $100,000, that might be a small percentage. So, the you know I think quality questions get you quality answers and I'm, I'm kind of going off on on a little bit of a tangent here but um, uh, finding that group that is also um, there to educate you on what to do with your finances or where you're going I think I think is important at, at any stage of, of investment advice and just making sure you're getting advice from uh, the right right people or right person so you're not having someone overweight telling you how to lose weight um, so a lot of time investments, uh, making sure the business is going well. Um, we'll talk about DJing fun just as a uh, producing music as, as a fun side thing. But um, probably 50, 60 percent of my day is spent around, like I mentioned, what, what am I going to do next? So it's meeting with the head of psychology of Phoenix Children's Hospital. It's talking to VCs on what they're seeing in this in this space, not because I want to raise money. I want to learn what I can do. I've got a call set up tonight with the founder of Zillow, a, a Spencer Radcliffe, and um you know, spending time getting getting through to him to be able to get on that call like that that takes time. That's yeah. not one email away, right? That's like yep. a number of different different ways and, and and things to get there. So, uh, spending time essentially embracing how uncomfortable it is for me not to have a set day to day. If I pick up the phone and make a call, I can make a sale and then I can make more money or I can have more impact. I don't have that clear path to impact today, so I'm enjoying this. It was uncomfortable, uh, truthfully, for probably the first like three or four months after the acquisition of space to say, okay, I've got a blank canvas. What am I passionate about? Um, what do I want to make an impact on? What do I want to change? And getting more deliberate and clear onto what those spaces are um, and then where the opportunities are in those spaces and then who are the right people to know and meet and learn from in those spaces. That's taking up the majority of my day. Yeah, wow, that is tremendous. Um, the, you left out the DJ part, uh, which I was I'm digging for. Yeah. So how do, is that always been a passion for years before, or is that just something? You know, I um, it's probably six, seven years ago. I had, you know, I'd mentioned like small addiction to uh, technology and cell phones. So uh-huh. I, I think a lot of us can ho- probably relate to this, especially if you're an entrepreneur. Where at one point I would wake up, I'd go right on the right on the phone, and and again, I it would be I would lie to myself because I'd say, oh, it's okay, because I'm not just scrolling on Instagram. I'm just emails and Slack and working. 
but I still get a lot of screen time. And really, I get to speak with the, um, the head of addiction at Stanford, and she really made a really clear case to me that the cell phone is modern-day cocaine. So a cocaine addiction, cell phone, it's those dopamine hits, quick dopamine hits, where we need that to even just stay level at this point. So imagine a, a coke addict who needs to do more and more drugs just to feel normal. Like, that's how we right. become with a cell phone. And she made a really good case for me. I immediately deleted Instagram, Facebook, email, and Slack from my cell phone. I can still go on them on the computer, but they're less accessible where I'm walking to the bathroom and checking Instagram as I'm going. So I have to be in front of my computer, open it up, and actually go on it there. And, and, and that was a really good, realistic example. She's like, she has a flip phone. She's like, yeah, I don't ever go on it. I'm like, that's not realistic for my life. But having those boundaries where yeah. I can only go on the computer was was uh, important for me. But um, back, to, back to music. I went to uh, Coachella Music Festival. I think at this point it was five, six years ago. And uh, there was really poor service there. And so I just left my phone. And it was really the first time since I was maybe 17 where I hadn't been on my phone for, like, I had several hours break of not being on my cell phone. Mm. And I just had this amazing, like, clarity of not just being, you know, on yeah. tech, plugged in, plugged in. And I get to just, uh, and I don't do drugs. I, r- I rarely drink. But, um, again, no judgment if anyone does any of that stuff. But it's... um. I just like the music and the energy at these these places, like these festivals and EDM festivals. Like everyone's so fucking happy. Like it was so awesome. It was my first exposure to that, and I just freaking fell in love with the music, the culture, everything around it. So, yeah, it's been a passion from afar. And then maybe about um, two two and a half years ago, I started learning how to DJ and learn how to produce music. And then um, just you know uh, had enough breath after the the exit of the business to be able to start releasing some of the music. So I'm maybe three four months in, we got like half little over half a million streams on, you know, three wow. or four songs, which is cool. So starting to uh, build out some better collab collaborations and build out the project. I played at my first festival this weekend, Gold Rush here. There's like, I think 40,000 attendees there. And stuff. How about so, you, man? Yeah, thanks, man. So it's been a really fun, uh, to be honest, the most intriguing part is I wanted to see something I had zero background in. I didn't know how to read music. I never played an instrument. How fast can I take it from here to an ultimate stage, which is, you know, an EDC, a Coachella, an ultra music festival? How fast yeah. can I get the project to there? It's more of just like an interesting uh, uh, experiment I'm doing with myself. Wow. So it's, I mean, part of it's the passion, but part of it is quite literally you're trying to, wow, you're, you're experimenting to see how quick you can get to the ultimate stage. Yeah, something about that gets me motivated and fun. I don't know why, but. Yeah, there's no does. money. It's just purely yeah. You seem like, so you treat life like a video game. Sure. It feels like. Tell me more about that. It seems like you're, you're, you have a high, you have a score in your head and it's not attached to some sort of financial record. Sure. Um, it could be cause you mentioned a billion dollar exit, but, yep. um, it's so the billion dollar exit is not because I want to be a billionaire. It's because in order to have that valuation on a business, you have to add so much value to the world in order to be to be valued at that even to raise a shit ton of money you have to get people to believe in your cause and vision so i i have a tangible goal but yep. it's but it's not for the reason and thank not you not for, for you it's not because i want to be a billionaire it's because i want to create that much value you know tony robbins says business is a spiritual game you have to consistently add value in order to be rewarded with someone in commerce someone handing you money so you know money is the exchange of value right so i have to add a shit ton of value to be valued at a billion dollar uh business so that's the excitement there. And then, um, you know, back to the relativity for me again, Tony Robbins thing. I can't tell I'm a bit of a fan of his, um, growth equals happiness. And, and the second, you know, I wanted to make six figures. I did. I wouldn't say I got depressed. That's kind of aggressive, but I got low and I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't motivated. And then I rose the bar a little bit more and then I didn't get motivated when I hit it, when I hit it, when I hit it. Yeah. A- and it became, and it became this point where I literally said, I remember doing this like introspective thought. I said, if I was Oprah Winfrey at the time, um, would I be happy? And I said, no, I wouldn't. And I got really sad about that. And then I got really fucking excited because it means you can grow every single day and it'll never be enough. And at first that was sad, but it made life so exciting because there's no end goal. There's no finish line. It was so, I made, I wake up every day. I say, did I grow yesterday? Did I grow? Because gr- for me, I made this definition. Tony Robbins saying, growth equals happiness. So if I'm growing, I don't care what category it is. I'm growing to be a better speaker, better at getting interviewed. I'm growing to be a better friend, a better a boyfriend, what, business, whatever it is. Like if I'm growing, then today was a successful day and I'm happy about that and I'm happy. So yeah, whether it's DJing or next company or yep. being a really good partner, all I, w- all I want to do is is grow. That's all I want to do all day long and I get so fucking Tremendous. motivated around that. Do you, do you have any um, 
Um, like, do you write down goals? Do you journal? It, some do, some don't. Yeah. Um, cause online, you know, you go online, everybody's always talking about journaling, meditating, blah, sure. blah, blah. And then you'll find some guys that are just like, no, I don't do any of that shit. I just work hard. Yeah. You know, so what, where do you stand in all you know, that? I, th- I think the work hard is interesting, right? Cause you can run a hundred miles an hour into, into a wall. Um, and I think that might've been my old version of me. So I just kind of bust my ass and, you know, trust in God and the process and everything like that. Mm-hmm. But I've really gotten a lot more um, clear on what I wanted to do um, in life. And, and, you know, I think meditation kind of comes at like this, like hippie voodoo spiritual thing um, up in the air that most people kind of roll their eyes at. So I, I heard someone one time called a pause period that was fucking genius. So in the morning I have a 10 minute pause period, which means I have no phone. I'm not by anyone. I'm just outside. <coughs> and I'm just thinking, and I'm just thinking, what do I want to do with my life, my day? I'm thinking about anything. There's no, there's no set structure on it. And a lot of times I find myself wandering around what gets me excited or deep questions or deep thinking and stuff. And it, it's a pause period. And I, I don't think that turns anyone off. Meditation, I think can turn some people off or, uh, even if you're not religious, prayer can turn some people off. Yeah. Pause Cause period. it feels so structured. Yeah. Take a pause from the day. Just, just no, there's no input. There's nothing coming in. There's n- nothing coming in. It's just your time to just think. And you could, I could think about, is that, is this fake? Is this real? Do I like, do I want one of these in my house? doesn't matter what it is, but <laughs> just that time I found myself being able to get a lot more deliberate with w- what I want to do with my life. And, and, and from there it was like, I set goals, but um, I didn't necessarily write them down or do anything with it, but I, but I, but I kind of did and started coming to more and more fruition. And then I started, then I did start writing them down and I would start, you know, you could say journaling again, but, but it could be a note in my notepad in my phone. If it's just throughout the day, a thought or something like that, it could be um, a physical journal. Um, it could be like, I've got a poster in my room as far as my top four goals that I want to accomplish this year. Like those are newer iterations I'd say over the last year or two for myself. But um, that po- if I could leave with one, if I leave anybody with one thing uh, practice, it would just take in a couple minutes in the morning before anything. And I, someone explained this to me, like setting the radio dial for the day. So what station are you on? Are you on, you know, hip hop? Are you on EDM? Are you on country music? Like, and then that's the station that plays for the day, right when you wake up. And if you go right on your phone, you go right to work or you go right into something, you're setting the station in maybe a station you, you, you didn't choose. You kind of just like shut your eyes and did it real quick and you're going and, and you're just living. You're being reactive instead of proactive. And that idea of just setting the station, what's my intention today? What do I want to accomplish today? What do I want to do what gets me excited, that pause period in the morning has been, been extremely beneficial to my life. Wow, that is tremendous. Um, well, I know we're short on time, so I, I want to, you know, let you out of here before I do, though. Where can they find you, first of all, sure. uh, to connect with you? Yeah. So I'll let you go there. Yeah, I'm super active on, on uh, Instagram, on my computer. Uh, but uh, <laughs> um, uh, it's my first last name, Anthony Sarandria, and I... Uh, We'll put it in the link in the description awesome. too. I, I reply to every single person anytime I do a podcast that it might take me a day, a week, a month, but I reply to every single person as far as if you've got questions or anything and help with business wise. I've had, I've had so many uh, podcasts I've listened to that taught me so much or so many mentors or anything. It'd be my honor to, to pay it forward. And to be honest, it's, that's not even me necessarily being a good guy as much as I realize that there's this um, mutual benefit to the mentee mentor relationship where at a certain point, I didn't really understand it at, at the time, but now I get it. Anyone who's ever mentored or coached, like I get more out of this shit than you do. Like I do as the, as the, the, you know, the mentor, like it's more beneficial and exciting and motivating for me to, to help you and see you grow or see a piece of me and you grow and mentors above me did this to me as well too. Then it is going to make more money or going to do something else. So it's, it, it's very interesting to realize. I always thought it was a leech when I was being mentored or mentee. I always thought it was leeching off people. I didn't realize I was actually providing them more, value than they were providing me. I just didn't know it because they were giving me tactical financial or business advice, but I was giving them something so much more powerful, which was purpose. And for me, being able to help people, even uh, even if it's just replying to a message on a question for business or life or anything, gives me purpose, which is an incredibly yeah. rich currency. Wow. Well, thanks for coming, man. Yeah, this, course, is this is phenomenal. phenomenal. Yeah, um, thanks for sending it out, bro. Yeah, I can't wait to rewatch it and take notes and just, wow, phenomenal story and Thanks, Phenomenal brother. person, man. Thanks Thank for coming. Thank you, brother. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah.